All right, it's 1015. I want to welcome everyone back from your short break. Um, I'm Rachel, I'm the MC, and we're here with Christine Hare. I will go ahead and um, take a minute to recognize our sponsors who made this event possible. I have two short videos that I'm going to play from Trio National and the National Kidney Foundation. On behalf of TRIO National, congratulations, Michelle and Marty Marin and your TRIO Maryland chapter for putting together this fantastic conference adapted for the restrictions of pandemic year past. Great work. Anybody else would like to join TRIO in making things like this happen, go to our website at trioweb.org and sign up. You can make a big world of difference just like TRIO Maryland is with that kind of leadership. My name is Stephen Potter. I'm a transplant surgeon at Baylor Scott and White Health in Temple, Texas. Mm -hmm. I want to take great care of patients with compassion and empathy. You have a chance to really be vertically integrated into the patient's care, follow them along, and learn about their stories and their families. And it's fantastic to see them get back to work in a healthier life after transplant. And obviously as a surgeon, uh, I want to provide the best possible technical outcome for them. Post-transplant surveillance is incredibly important and doesn't get enough attention because it's one of the keys to prolonging allograft half-life or how long the patient keeps their kidney and stays off dialysis. Staying off dialysis adds years to their lives. It adds quality of life. So post-transplant surveillance is a critical, critical issue. Donor-derived cell-free DNA differs from the existing alternatives because it helps us know whether there's rejection or inflammation in the transplanted kidney. It can lead to biopsy when otherwise biopsy wouldn't be obtained because it increases your uh, suspicion that there's going to be rejection. It can also prevent unnecessary biopsies because a low donor-derived cell-free DNA level gives you very positive information that there's not going to be rejection in that organ. Thank you. I am sorry, I misspoke. I said Trio National and the National Kidney Foundation. I meant Care DX. A National Kidney Foundation sponsor video will be shown in the next session. Um, so I would like to do go through some housekeeping before we get started. I have a slide here. So um, just so we all are aware, this uh, webinar is being recorded. The recordings will be sent to all participants after the event. Uh, we also have a general meeting room, which some of you may or may not have been to already, where you can chat face to face with other participants. The Zoom room will be open from 10 until 12, and I will put a link in the chat box towards the end of this session so that you can attend. Um, and if you need any support during this session, please text 410-635-0229. Um, we have a comments and questions are available so you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions which will be answered by Christine at the end of the session. And then the chat feature is available to communicate with other participants. This is a webinar format so you will not be able to see or hear the other attendees. You are here for the pre and post transplant nutrition and diet recommendations by Christine Hare. Christine studied at the University of Dayton and received her Bachelor of Science in Dietetics. Is that right? Diet Dietetics. <laughs> Dietetics. Um, yes. And graduated magnum cum laude. Christine is the lead interactive kidney smart education classes, is the lead for interactive kidney smart education classes with chronic kidney disease patients. She educates patients on CKD basics, understanding their lab values, diet, medications, and provides an overview of kidney transplant and dialysis. She works with local nephrologists to encourage recommendations to the Kidney Smart class and to develop marketing material to schedule patients and tasks in Salesforce. Welcome, Christine, and I will let you take it away from here. All right. 
Are you going to do the poll first? Oh, or should yes, I? the poll. Okay. <laughs> can, you, can you see the results? I don't, oh, I don't see it actually. Okay, I don't. so yes. Um, we had the poll running and um, it looks like 93% have um, responded. So the first question was, please describe why you're here. 60, I'm sorry, 41% say they have a transplant. Okay. 43% are waiting on a transplant. 3% are potential donors. And 13% are family members. Um, and then please tell us why, what type of organ transplant you are here to learn more about. 53% say kidney, 36% say liver, 2% pancreas, 4% heart, and 5% lung. Very cool. So we got a good mix. Awesome. All right. Well, we will pull up the slides. All right. So let me get in here. All right. So let me share. Oh, gosh. Let me pull. Share my screen. And pull this up. Can you guys see my slides? I see them. <laughs> okay, so if you see them, hopefully everyone else can yeah. too. Well, welcome everybody. This is Christine. Uh, and you know, this was the poll we already did. So if, I typically do this uh, presentation in person where I can ask everyone a little bit about themselves. So it's really nice to see the mix that we have between pre and post transplant and definitely mix of organ types. Uh, just a little bit about me. I, I, I am a registered dietitian. I'm a certified renal specialist. I worked at a transplant center at University of Maryland for 14 years, and now I do teach kidney smart classes, uh, which we do focus a lot on transplant. Uh, and just a few pictures, so you can see a little bit about myself. So today's objectives, uh, really wanna learn about the importance of nutrition throughout the transplant process. Uh, we do have a mix of people here today. So I wanna talk a little bit about pre-transplant, that post-operative phase, as well as long-term uh, and talk about different nutrients that may need to be focused on or limited uh, and hopefully get some time for questions at the end. So, you know, why am I here today? Uh, this, the, the whole conference today is amazing and it really gives people so much information on transplant in general, but, but why is nutrition important? Uh, it, this is actually really huge. Nutrition, as well as one's functional status, has a really big impact on transplant outcomes uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, one being that immediate post-operative period with post-operative healing. Uh, for those of you that have already had your transplant, you know this, a transplant is a big operation and proper nutrition really helps with that healing process between the adequate protein, uh, blood sugar management, managing your different electrolytes, all of that really has to come together. And also the long-term health, uh, working on things such as weight management, just any disease-specific management, as well as stabilization of your labs and electrolytes is huge. So let's circle back to that pre-transplant process. For those of you that are still waiting on your organs, uh, things to focus in on, really optimizing your nutrition and what we call functional status. Everyone I know we have a, a different variety of organ types today. Uh, one thing that's usually pretty common between most people waiting for transplants is usually a low sodium diet is indicated. Uh, so most people should be watching their sodium intake. Also really maintaining an appropriate protein intake. Now this differs greatly person to person. Uh, for someone with kidney disease, for example, they may need a, a lower protein intake if they're not on dialysis higher if they are on dialysis, particularly home dialysis. With liver disease, often someone needs more protein as well. Uh, I really encourage you to work with your dietitian to figure out what your protein needs are, because everyone is certainly very different. Also, adjusting electrolytes is needed. Uh, with kidney disease, oftentimes people may have to limit their potassium and phosphorus intake. Uh, with someone who may be waiting for a heart transplant, if they have heart failure, uh, and maybe they are on a lot of diuretics, they may actually need more potassium. So again, this is something to work with your, your team, your dietitian, to really figure out you know, wh what nutrients do you need more of or less of. Trying to maintain or strive for a healthy weight, uh, whether it might be to gain weight or to lose a little bit of weight, uh, coming into that transplant it, it, you know, at a, a good weight for you can really help with outcomes. 
And then this last point, this is something that's becoming really more and more important, I think, to a lot of transplant centers, is trying to maintain your level of activity as well as you can, improve your functional status. They've really seen that people with an improved functional status do have a quicker recovery postoperatively, which is huge because that has better outcomes. Work with your team. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, every transplant team has a dietitian. During the pre-transplant process, you may meet with them automatically. If you don't, I really encourage you to talk with your nurse coordinator to set you up to meet with the dietitian, whether in person or virtually, to really help you understand what nutrition guidelines may be best for you uh, and optimize that functional status, whether it's just trying to get a little more activity in. I've had patients that even will do physical therapy kind of preoperatively to build up their, their functional status as well. Once you get that transplant, Postoperatively, uh, that initial focus is really going to be on protein intake. Uh, protein is super important to help our bodies heal, uh, partly just from the inside out to help heal that surgical wound closure. Uh, the other big piece is anytime you're in the hospital, particularly after a surgery, your body goes into what they call a catabolic state which means your muscle is breaking down. So making sure you're getting adequate protein in is super important to, to, for that whole healing process and to get you into that state of recovery. Uh, so, and this is tough because especially post-operatively, uh, you may be still be adjusting after some of the anesthesia, you may be have a little bit of nausea, uh, but really when you get your meals, try to make sure you're eating that protein first on your plate. Uh, many hospitals have alternative menus where sometimes eating like the chicken salad or the tuna salad may be better tolerated. Uh, and they usually will always offer you supplemental drinks such as a boost or inshore as well if your appetite is still not great, but definitely focus on that protein. Uh, managing blood sugars is really important for that healing process as well. For someone that has diabetes, it's important to be on proper medications. Uh, and even people that didn't have diabetes coming into a transplant, initially just the stress on the body and some of the, the medications, you may see a little bit of an elevation in blood sugar. So that's not necessarily a surprising thing. But just really trying to focus on that consistent carbohydrate diet and getting those blood sugars controlled. And again, your, your team will balance any of those electrolyte imbalances in the hospital. Uh, and once you get out of the hospital, just paying attention to your labs uh, and, and, and changing your potassium, your phosphorus, magnesium intake as needed. Uh, that low sodium diet generally for most people is still needed. This last point is really important too, proper hydration. Uh, after a transplant, you really do need lots of water for most of us. Uh, and this is a big change for many people, uh, whether you had, you know, were on a fluid restriction due to ascites or someone on hemodialysis or had heart failure. Uh, many people coming into a transplant are in quite a fluid restriction. So going in and trying to get a lot more fluid in may be a challenge at first, but definitely continue to really drink that water and follow the fluid guidelines that your team gives you. Longer term, you know, maintain striving for a healthy body weight, focus on small changes. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, Christine, I want to lose 60 pounds, which, you know, that's great. Uh, but it's also, I think people can get discouraged when they set really, really big lofty goals. Sometimes just focus on those small healthy changes uh, and really work with your team to, to help you get there. Manage any other health issues you may be having. Most of us don't just have an organ transplant. There's other things that go into it. We may have high blood pressure or diabetes, high cholesterol. So whatever else is going on, make sure you're paying attention to those and managing those as best you can. Keeping your electrolytes within target range uh, and then also being really aware of drug nutrient interactions. Uh, Post-transplant, you will want to avoid grapefruit and grapefruit juice, uh, pomegranate juice and Seville oranges as they do interfere with one of the main transplant medications, Prograf. Uh, also, just use caution with things like Fresca and Sunny Delight. They do have small amounts of grapefruit juice, uh, so you should be careful with that. Food safety is another thing that impacts every patient with a transplant. Uh, transplant or not, it's something we should all be careful with. Uh, but after a transplant, being on the immunosuppression and sometimes other antibiotics, you are more susceptible to issues with, with food safety. Uh, you may get it more severe. And if you were to get even a mild case of foodborne illness, it can lead to diarrhea and, and severe dehydration. Uh, so just some typical points to really look at, make sure you're cooking meats to the proper temperature, make sure you have a meat thermometer so you can actually check that. 
Uh, some common things to avoid raw or undercooked meat, uh, seafood, raw eggs. If you're ever at a restaurant, sometimes Caesar dressings do use raw eggs in it. So that's something to always check. And some common seafood dishes that people like are things like sushi or ceviche. I see poke bowls everywhere these days, uh, raw oysters. Uh, so those were things I would avoid because that raw seafood you, know, you puts you at higher risk. Washing all fruits and vegetables well. Uh, and one of my favorite points, just keep hot food hot and cold food cold. You don't want to eat that burger that's been sitting on the counter for a couple of hours. Uh, just super important, kind of common sense, but very important to recognize that. Uh, things like buffets and salad bars, I, I would typically try to avoid and make sure your dairy is pasteurized. Supplements is another question that I, I get a lot of questions on. I think part of it is because things like vitamins, minerals, herbal supplements, there's a little bit of a health halo around those. We think of them as natural uh, and natural is better, right? Uh, which you, what you always wanna remember is just because something is natural, it's still medicinal. So my guidance for anyone with a transplant is to avoid herbal supplements unless they have been cleared by your nephrologist, by your pharmacist, uh, by your transplant team. Uh, and there's some important reasons for that. There are many, many supplements that have interactions with transplant medications, uh, as well as a lot of other common medicines that people may be on. Uh, some common ones that do have interactions are things like St. John's wort, echinacea, ginseng. Uh, there's also a lot of herbal supplements that, again, can interact with other medicines and cause blood clotting issues, which would be huge in a transplant patient. Uh, so you want to be very careful with that. Uh, the other piece is just herbal supplements are not uh, regulated the same way medications are. So you could be think you're getting St. John's wort uh, at a certain percentage. It may be something completely different. Uh, and so we just really don't want to risk that. Uh, so that's something I would use extreme caution with and really do not take anything over the counter unless it's cleared by your team. Uh, another supplement from kind of a different background is something called creatine you may have heard of. Uh, it's often in protein shakes, uh, or if you were to go to GNC, maybe you weren't eating well, you needed more protein. Uh, someone at GNC might say, hey, this, this shake will help you build muscle. And you might think that, hey, Christine told me I need to build muscle. This would be a good thing. But if you see creatine on that label, I don't want you to take that because creatine can definitely put more pressure on your kidneys. Uh, so with protein powders, you want to just stick with ones that are protein, no additional creatine. Uh, talk with your physician, your dietitian, your pharmacist about any vitamin or mineral supplements that you want to take. Uh, mega dose vitamins aren't necessarily mega healthy. Uh, they can impact a lot of other things. So always clear that we are all different in what we need. Uh, and then one other product just to use a little caution with is sugar alcohol. Uh, it's not harmful per se, uh, but sugar alcohol is used in a lot of things like baked goods, sugar-free candies, protein bars. They put it in there because we don't absorb it all the way, so it doesn't affect our blood sugars. You don't absorb the carbohydrates or the calories, uh, but sugar alcohol can cause diarrhea. Uh, and so in a transplant patient, again, Combined with just some of the other medicines you're on, it may affect you more where you might have diarrhea that again could lead to dehydration. So if it has sugar or alcohol, just try a little bit of it and see how you tolerate it. Striving for a healthy body weight, this is something that can be a challenge for everyone, but particularly after a transplant. Uh, some of the reasons for this, uh, hopefully you'll be feeling better. Uh, when you feel better, you might not have that nauseousness. Uh, a big one, just a less inflammatory state. Uh, Pre-transplant, uh, whether you know, when you're in organ failure, your body is definitely in an inflam inflamed state. Uh, just an example for someone on dialysis waiting for a kidney transplant. Dialysis is inflammatory on its own. So someone's calorie needs, their protein needs are much higher when you're on dialysis. Uh, once you get into that long-term uh, post-transplant phase, your calorie needs and protein needs actually decrease, but your appetite is probably better than it was before. So that sometimes can lead to some weight gain. Uh, steroids such as prednisone, this can of course increase your appetite. Uh, the good thing is prednisone is used, being used much, much less than it was when I know when I first started with transplant. Uh, so you're seeing less of that weight gain attributed to it. And I always encourage people, try not to use prednisone as a crutch. Uh, if it's a medicine you need, you need it. So work around it and just really focus on that healthy eating pattern. 
Uh, and again, you, you probably are going to have less dietary restrictions overall, uh, which is, again, a good thing with more acceptable choices. But if we're eating more things and not cutting back somewhere else, sometimes you see some, some weight, weight gain. So just something to keep an eye on. With healthy lifestyle goals, one of my favorite tips is focus on fiber. Uh, fiber helps keep you full. The, the average American a goal is about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day, uh, and most people get much less than that. <laughs> uh, so this is something to really pay attention to and, and try to see, can I get more fiber into my diet? Uh, places like whole grains, your beans, vegetables, fruits are all great sources of fiber. Uh, if this is something that you know you're low in, I would increase gradually as it sometimes can affect your, your GI tract a little bit. Uh, and again, everybody is different. So work with your team to, to see if that 25 to 35 gram of the fiber goal is appropriate for you. Uh, and I always tell people this, if you're, you're going for something fruit, go for the whole fruit, not the fruit juice. Because if you're having the apple, you're getting the fiber, you're getting all the phytochemicals and the minerals where you get the apple juice, no fiber, more added sugar. It's just, they're not the same. So always go with the whole fruit versus the fruit juice and watch portion sizes, which I'll talk about more in a second. And the biggest one truly is just focus on real food. See if you can limit the processed foods. Your processed foods, you're gonna end up getting number one, a ton more sodium in it, uh, but just really try to look and see if you can find things with less of an ingredient list. That's huge. So fresh fruits and vegetables or frozen veggies, uh, your fresh meats, whole grains that don't have a million different added things in them and limited added sugars is a really, really good thing. Uh, so that's a really important point that I think all of us should do. I try to choose lean proteins, particularly, you know, if you're, you're looking to, to kind of lose weight or keep your, get your weight down a little bit. Uh, some keys to look for, you know, if you're buying ground beef or turkey, look for things that are at least 93% lean. Uh, some key words, if you're ordering like something, if it ends in the word loin or round, like a sirloin or eye of round, do tend to be leaner cuts as well. Uh, and if you're having chicken or turkey, if you take the skin off or choose the lighter meat, you will get less saturated fat. Uh, so that's important for someone that may be watching their cholesterol levels. Fish is a wonderful thing to include, uh, particularly fresh fish, if it's grilled or broiled. And also, you know, focus on those beans, the nuts. Uh, there's so much evidence that a plant-based diet is so helpful for us for overall health. So trying to incorporate maybe more meatless meals, whether it's a meatless Monday or maybe meatless a couple days a week, uh, can be a really good impact for a lot of people on their health. And lower fat dairy, again, especially if you have to watch that cholesterol. And eggs and egg whites are a terrific protein choice too. And if you are frying foods, try to use a minimal amount of oil uh, and focus on those healthier fats like olive oil, avocado oil, sesame oil are all some of my favorites to use. Uh, and the sesame oil in particular has such a great flavor to it. They all have their own little flavor, but good, good things to try out. When you're looking for a healthy balance, uh, one of my favorite things to think about is just picture a plate and then make half your plate be veggies. Uh, your vegetables are wonderful because they're full of fiber, they're full of nutrients, uh, and they fill you up. And they're very, they tend to be lower in calories and higher in fiber. Uh, so try to make half your plate veggies, and then maybe a quarter of your plate may be some grains, a quarter of the plate be the protein, but that's a great balance to look for. And you can even throw on some of the fruit and the veggie side if you want. Uh, but that's that balance where I think your typical American plate, when I picture going to like a steakhouse, you usually got this big piece of meat, this huge mound of mashed potatoes, and maybe a couple pieces of asparagus to make the plate look a little bit green. We want to really kind of turn that plate upside down and focus more on the vegetables. Also try to focus mainly on non-caloric fluids such as water, uh, sparkling water, you know, add lemon, lime juice to it for a little bit of flavor. That way you're getting the hydration, but you're not getting a lot of the additional sodium or sugar. I always encourage my patients to, to keep a food diary, whether it's an old fashioned journal, uh, or I, I love if, you're, if you have a smartphone, the apps such as Lose It or My Fitness Pal, even if you're not trying to lose weight, are a great way just to track what you're taking in so that when you do see your team, you can share, hey, this is what I've been eating, and, and they can easily give you any suggestions. Uh, the reason why I think food diaries are a great way or, or these apps is most of us underestimate what we eat by about one third. Uh, so it, it really is tough when we're trying to lose weight. People always like, what? I know I'm not eating too much, but sometimes we're not estimating our portions right or we just forget the little things that we snack on throughout the day. 
So this portion size, this always blows me away when you look at this. And this is something that I think is so important uh, is just really thinking about how big are my foods supposed to be? Because portion sizes have exploded. In the past 40 years, they've gotten so much bigger. So when you think of a bagel, I want you to think of a bagel about the size of a hockey puck. Uh, that's not big. <laughs> uh, it, it's more along the lines of one of those little mini bagels you may see in at the grocery store. Uh, definitely not the size of a bagel that you might get at Panera. That doesn't mean you can't have a bagel at Panera, but just think about maybe just having half the bagel. Uh, or if you know you're having that, be mindful with your starch portions the rest of the day. Uh, or do like the bagel thins or those mini bagels when you're looking at something that may be a little lower in carbohydrates, it's also gonna have less sodium. Uh, so that's just a great thing to think about. The potato one always gets me too. A potato the size of a computer mouse. Uh, again, it takes me back to that steakhouse. When you think of a baked potato at a steakhouse, probably closer to the size of my head than it is to the size of a computer mouse. Uh, potatoes are not the enemy. Uh, they're just something that we do want to be mindful of portions with. Uh, and also just, if, especially with the sodium, watch what you're putting on it. Uh, with rice, pasta, cereal, about the size of a tennis ball is about one cup, just so you can kind of eyeball those portions. And with fruit, a, a medium piece of fruit about the size of a baseball, a cup of a fruit about the size of a tennis ball. I typically, what I do is I just kind of ball up my fist when I'm looking at fruit and know that's about a portion of fruit. Uh, in dried fruit, if you ever are having something like dried cranberries or raisins, uh, a third of a cup is a portion, so a golf ball size, because when the fruit is dried up, it's more concentrated in sugar uh, and other nutrients such as potassium as well, so the portion size is smaller. And then with proteins, so if someone told you you should have about three ounces of protein at dinner, that's about the size of a deck of cards. Uh, is it six ounces? It would be double that, obviously. So just a good kind of thing to kind of keep in mind. Uh, and then the dice is a great way. One ounce of cheese is about four dice. Uh, two tablespoons of margarine or salad dressing, about two dice. So great to keep in mind. Uh, one of my favorite ones is that one ounce of hard candy or nuts. If any of you ever buy a bag of nuts, usually the portion size is in ounces. I mean, who knows what an ounce looks like? I know I don't, and I'm a dietitian. Uh, so that like an egg size portion approximately of, of nuts is about one ounce. Uh, so that's a great way just to keep that in mind. And then ice cream, half a tennis ball, which I know is a very sad portion of ice cream. One tip I oftentimes will put ice cream in a tea mug versus a bowl because it looks full. It's it's a, it's funny, you kind of kind of trick our mind a little bit, but it's a great way so you can still enjoy a lot of the things you like, but just maybe in a, a little, little bit smaller portion. Sodium is something we're going to really want to watch as well. Uh, most people are going to want to follow a low sodium diet, which is less than 2,000 milligrams per day. Uh, a tip I often give people is if you can keep most meals under 600 milligrams per meal, you're going to be in really good shape. The thing that really gets me all the time is one tiny teaspoon of table salt has 2,300 milligrams. Uh, so that little bit of added salt, that's your whole day. So really try to look for alternative seasonings like garlic powder, pepper, Mrs. Dash. Uh, read your food label so you can see how much sodium is in there. And always look at that serving size as well. Uh, so it's just really important to look at it. If something has 20% daily value or more, that's considered a significant source of it. Uh, if it's 5% or less, that's a lower source of it. But I always, I'm a particular fan of looking at the exact milligrams under 140 is considered low sodium. But again, just focus on keeping it under 600 per meal. Uh, limit your sodium intake. Again, just cho choosing more fresh or frozen foods, less canned foods will help get you there. If you are getting canned foods, uh, try to opt for those lower sodium choices like the no salt added. Uh, if you have the regular ones, rinse them off. That won't get rid of all the sodium. If you rinse it off really, really thoroughly, it'll get rid of about 50% of the sodium. So there's usually a still a fair amount left. So that's why I always will try to do fresh or frozen if you can. One thing to also keep in mind, uh, low sodium on the front of a label does not necessarily mean it's low in sodium. It means it's 30% less than the original product. Uh, I, the, the biggest culprit I see with this is like a low sodium soup. Uh, many of your low sodium soups are not low sodium at all. They're lower than the original version, but you really want to look at the label to see how much sodium is actually in that. And again, look at the serving size. One thing also, uh, many of us are really good about not adding salt at home, but when we go out to eat, I don't think we always real realize how much sodium is in the food. Uh, eating out can have a lot more sodium. 
Uh, one thing just to show you guys, uh, this little sodium quiz. So just, you can put it in the chat box if you'd like, uh, or just something to think about. I had a patient recently was telling me how she was really working on her sodium intake. And when she would go out to lunch, sometimes she'd go to Burger King and she was really happy. She's like, I've been getting the salad, the salad with chicken. And I get the Italian dressing with it. Cause she thought that would be better than the ranch. Uh, and you know, we, I'm, you know, she's like, is that a good choice? And to be honest, I, you know, I don't know the sodium amount in the Burger King salad. So we looked it up together. Uh, so definitely think about what you think might be the answer to this. Uh, I know I was pretty blown away because <laughs> uh, we think a lot of times of sodium as the chips and the pretzels, and we think of a salad as a healthy option, but that Burger King salad with the Italian dressing, 1300 milligrams of sodium. Uh, so she was really, so we kind of went back and looked at the menu to kind of find some better options for her. So that's what I encourage if you're going out to eat, if it is a chain restaurant, looking ahead, looking at their menu and trying to find things, it might be hard to keep it under 600 milligrams, but you can at least make a better choice or maybe eat half of something. Uh, so just something to think about. Uh, with potassium, some people do have to limit this as well. Uh, part, you know, Post-transplant, it may be affected by medications, uh, by the prograph or the tacrolimus levels. If they're running a little high, it may pull that potassium up. Some blood pressure medications may affect the potassium as well. Um, or at least in the other direction, if you may be on diuretics, both pre or post-transplant, uh, your potassium may be low where you may need more of it. Uh, so just, again, knowing what your potassium level is and mo modifying your diet accordingly. Uh, some examples of high potassium foods include bananas, potatoes, tomatoes, oranges. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, so these are just some examples. And just to kind of drive home that portion point again, uh, a low potassium fruit is such as strawberries can easily become high potassium if that portion is larger. Uh, so if you're eating five strawberries, it's low in potassium. If you got some fresh strawberries from the farmer's market in town, they're going to be in season really soon, and you sat down and ate 20 plus of them, uh, all of a sudden, that's really high in potassium. So just something to be conscious of if potassium is something that you do have to limit. Phosphorus is another mineral that often in the immediate post-transplant phase may be low transiently. Uh, so your dietitian or your team may encourage you to increase your phosphorus intake. Uh, some great sources of phosphorus include dairy products, whole grains, beans, nut butters, and anything with protein will naturally have phosphorus in it as well. Uh, particularly some individuals with kidney disease may need to limit phosphorus, particularly pre-transplant. Uh, if you ever have to limit your phosphorus intake, uh, the big thing I always encourage you to focus is on limiting what they call the inorganic sources. Uh, that's, you know, when phosphorus is added to a food. Uh, the organic phosphorus would be the naturally occurring that we see in like your whole grains and your nuts. And we only absorb about 40% of that. When food manufacturers add phosphoric acid to a Pepsi or sodium phosphate to some turkey breast, uh, we absorb all of that. So it's much harder on the kidneys. Uh, so I always tell people just when you look at the ingredient list, if you see anything with PHOS in it, that's something I would try to limit because that signifies the added phosphorus. Uh, but again, post-transplant, you may be able to increase your intake of some of these foods if your level was low. Magnesium is another one that may be transiently low post-transplant. Uh, some people may even need a magnesium supplement uh, that your physician may recommend. Oftentimes, they'll kind of weigh the cost-benefit of that as one of the big side effects of magnesium may be diarrhea. Uh, and in that diarrhea, you lose more magnesium. Uh, so sometimes they'll try to get you to focus on the diet, which again, is the dairy products, the whole grains, dark leafy greens. Uh, if you did do a supplement, there are some such as Mag Plus Pro and Magnesium Glyconate that may have less impact on the diarrhea. So just work with your team to see what they may recommend if you need a supplement. New onset diabetes after a transplant is something that may happen. Uh, it's more prevalent in people that may be a little bit overweight or obese, uh, older patients. Uh, it Part of the reason is just the improvement in kidney function for a lot of people after a kidney transplant, that insulin is moving through the body more quickly. So there's a tendency for the blood sugars to run up a little bit. Uh, and then just different medications in all transplant patients, you do see sometimes uh, an increase in the blood sugar levels. 
up. As with anyone with type 2 diabetes, the first thing if you saw a new onset diabetes would be looking at if, if weight is part of the equation. Often losing 5 to 10% of your body weight can really be effective in decreasing that insulin resistance. Uh, and then looking at a consistent carbohydrate diet, limiting those added sugars, and following up with an endocrinologist to make sure if you are needing, you know, whether it's insulin or uh, uh, an oral medication, that it's an appropriate one to help manage those blood sugars. Healthy eating plans, you know, long term, uh, people, this is probably one of the biggest questions I would always get is, well, what kind of diet should I be on? Uh, it's so hard. There's so many things out there from keto to different supplement plans. Uh, really and truly, I think following just a more real food diet uh, is what I always would recommend, not some sort of a, a, a diet where you're cutting out an entire food group. Uh, that may help you lose weight initially, but that's not a long-term healthy eating plan. And with our transplant, we have this new lease on life. We want to we be around here for the long haul and be healthy. Uh, a couple kind of typical diets that are, are generally good for patients that have had transplants are something like the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet. Uh, I really, truly, I always say just individualize it. So small, healthy changes. Work with your team to really individualize the plan that's right for you. With a Mediterranean diet, what I like about that uh, is it is definitely more plant-focused meals. Uh, so you will have some fish for protein. You're going to have plenty of vegetables, fruits, olive oil, uh, but you're going to get more of your protein from the nuts, from the beans. Uh, you will, you can still have a little bit of chicken here and there, a little bit of yogurt, a little bit of cheese and eggs, but that might not be the, the basis of your diet. But something like your, your red meat, your sweets, those are things that are going to be kind of that top of the pyramid. You're not going to have those as often. Uh, and that plant-focused diet can be really good long-term for people. And then the DASH diet, if you've heard of that, it st stands for the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. Uh, and this is something that uh, many people do have high blood pressure, you know, both pre- and post-transplant. And it's just honestly a healthy way to eat. It's going to be a low-sodium diet. The DASH diet does tend to be higher in potassium. So this is important just that you are getting your blood work checked regularly so they can monitor the potassium levels. Uh, that you're not levels aren't getting too elevated because there is a lot of fruits and vegetables in the DASH diet. Uh, and the NHLBI, uh, the NIH website, has a lot of good information as well as a sample meal plan on the DASH diet. Some great resources. Uh, honestly, the biggest one I would say is utilize your registered dietitian. Uh, there is a dietitian that's available through your transplant center, uh, pre, post transplant. Uh, if you're not sure who it is, talk with your nurse coordinator. Uh, but your registered dietitian is someone that can usually really help you figure out what might be some easy steps for you to take. Uh, they may be able to guide you just in some choices and what's right for you. Uh, it's hard when you're just Googling something on the internet uh, or talking to a friend. We, we all are different. So talk with a dietitian that knows you and knows your background. Some good websites, the American Heart Association is a really good one. Uh, another healthy living tab, there's a tab for recipes. There's a lot of really good low sodium heart healthy recipes for anybody. Uh, and the National Kidney Foundation as well has some great low sodium recipes. Uh, and you do have recipes section, uh, both for CKD stages one through four, people that are on dialysis, as well as post-transplant. And a post-transplant kidney diet would be very appropriate for almost any organ type. Just in review, uh, I think overall when someone says, what is a post-transplant diet? It, it's more in sense of kind of thinking of almost like a heart healthy diet. We're trying to keep our whole body, our whole heart, our whole being healthy for the long haul. Uh, so choosing more of those real foods, uh, drinking plenty of water, trying to maintain as healthy weight as possible. That's also important. And then just staying active. Uh, this may be different for everyone. For some people that might be getting back to running a half marathon. Others, it might be walking for five minutes multiple times a day or seated exercise, but that activity really helps keeps your muscles strong. Uh, so that's a real positive thing. Of course, that focus on food safety and really be careful with the foods, any kind of herbal supplements that you that might interact with medications. Just again, clear anything over the counter with your, your transplant team, uh, drinking plenty of water and communicate with your healthcare team. Uh, whether it's your dietitian, you know, when you're if you're looking at making some diet changes, 
uh, definitely your nurse coordinator, making sure you don't miss your lab draws so we can see how all your levels look. Uh, but your transplant team is going to be part of your family for the long haul. So make sure that you're staying in touch with them. Thank you guys so much for your attention today. And I'll turn it over to Rachel. We have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, sure. So go ahead, Rachel. Tell me, yes. what, tell me what we have. <laughs> um, so I'll start with a question from Mike. I got a lot of cramping and I'm wondering what the best foods or drinks may be helpful. Oh, so that's a great question, Mike. And again, this one thing I would check, the common nutrition causes of cramping can be low potassium or low magnesium levels. Uh, so before I would tell you to you know, start eating three bananas a day for your cramping, I want you to make sure to see if you can figure out the source of the cramping. So I would check with your team, uh, check if you get copies of your lab results, uh, check to see maybe what your potassium or your magnesium has been, but those are two very common causes of it from a nutrition perspective. Uh, sometimes dehydration as well. Uh, so that would be something I would definitely follow up with your team to see if they can identify the cause. If it was the potassium, uh, things like high potassium fruits would be things like bananas, melon. Uh, if you wanted to keep it lower carb, your dark leafy greens are a terrific source of both potassium and magnesium, nuts as well. Uh, but definitely check with your team to see if they can identify the cause of that cramping and you can kind of go from there. Thanks, Christine. Um, mm -hmm. Jim asks, what are your thoughts on treating CKD holistically? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think when you, you know, like with as far as holistic treatment, uh, I'm not sure if you mean like no medications at all or with trying different herbal supplements. Uh, so it, it, everyone means holistically a little bit differently. Uh, one thing I would say is with holistic treatment, I, I would want you to still be seeing a nephrologist so that they can monitor everything. Uh, generally, you know, the medications, whether it's a blood pressure medicine, are very effective and for most people the benefits outweigh the risks. So talking with your team about that. I have had some patients that have tried certain over-the-counter supplements that their nephrologist has agreed and said, hey, yes, this is worthwhile to try. Uh, and, and they did okay with it, but it's something that's really important to monitor that. Uh, from a holistic standpoint, the biggest thing I would focus on is that you know, what are you eating? Uh, so definitely a very plant-based diet. There's a lot of evidence that in CKD, uh, a, a focus on a plant-based diet may really delay progression. So I would kind of go that way and, and care with your nephrologist, kind of work with them. And if you did see a holistic doctor as well, uh, see if they can work with your kidney doctor. Thanks, Christine. Okay, Gwen asks, I'm eight years with a heart transplant. I used to love pink grapefruit, but I was told it was off my liquid drinks. Will I ever be able to return to it in time? Oh, Gwen, first of all, congratulations. That's amazing. Uh, and I, I get you. I'm a grapefruit person too. So the reason they don't want you to have the grapefruit uh, is that it does interact. It's, it's part of what they call the cytochrome, cytochrome P450 pathway in our body. So it may interfere with certain medications, including, I'm guessing you're probably on Prograf, uh, which is one of those common immunosuppressants, and it, it can affect the level. Uh, I have had patients that if they work really closely with their doctor, sometimes they incorporate it further away from the medicine. Uh, but that's something I would say, if you've been so stable, I would probably just keep avoiding it. But if it's something you are really and truly missing, talk with your doctor and pharmacist, and maybe they can say in small amounts further away from the medicine, they may, may be able to work for you, but it's something you'd want to definitely talk about with them. Uh, but, but I do, I know, I, I feel you on that one because grapefruit can be really good. <laughs> Okay, let's go to Katura. Um, she says, what are your thoughts on a vegetarian or vegan diet? Um, for context, she said she received a liver transplant 21 years ago as an infant. Amazing. So I think a, a vegetarian or a vegan diet uh, can be a great fit post organ transplant. Uh, and one of the things you see long term with transplants, whether it's liver transplant, heart transplant, kidney transplant, uh, you do see the immunosuppressants over time uh, can sometimes start to affect your kidney function a little bit. Uh, so that's where that plant-based diet can be really wonderful to help keep your, your kidneys healthy uh, and to keep your heart healthy, everything. So I think it's a great thing. I would encourage you if, if it's something that's a transition for you to, to work with a dietitian because sometimes I've seen people when they first go vegetarian or vegan, they start to 
not necessarily eat nutrient rich foods. They may kind of have a predominance of pastas and rices, and they may not be getting a good balance of proteins and may end up getting actually more sugar in their diet. Uh, so if it's something new for you, I would say definitely talk with your, your dietitian uh, to kind of help you figure out that balance that you need. So you're getting enough protein in as well to meet all of your nutrition needs. Uh, and if you are not ready to go straight vegan, uh, there's a big movement for kind of a, just a more plant focused diet with whole foods. Cause sometimes with a vegetarian diet, you still see really processed things. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had the, like the beyond burger. I use the example of, uh, there that is vegetarian, but it does have a fairly processed. Uh, so sometimes just using a more plant-based diet where maybe you still do a little bit of chicken or fish uh, if you want to, uh, but you're getting a predominance of vegetables and more of the beans and the nuts, that can be a great thing as well. Okay, Christine, unfortunately we are out of time. I want to thank you very much for all of your great insights. I have posted just now into the chat, the um, open Zoom room link. Um, and I think Christine, are you going to be there for a few minutes? Yes, yes, I will okay, head over so there. If you have additional questions that we did not answer, Christine will be there. And also, um, I am assuming you can see the last slide has Christine's email address and phone number so you can reach her um, for questions that you don't get answered today. I want to thank Trio Maryland again for the great programming and on this inform informative event. And um, please, Stay with us for the rest of the day. We have um, a t-shirt raffle uh, at the 12 o'clock closing. So thank you again, Christine. Thank you guys. All right. Bye-bye.